Thank you all for the introduction or for the invitation. I'm so excited to be talking about some of my latest inquiries with you. I'm also really excited to speak with a few of you tomorrow um, and for sending your work. It's been really exciting kind of pouring into that. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I got to make you co-host. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me, geez. Your co-host, ma'am. Great. So what I'm actually going to do is just screen share my entire desktop. And I've basically created a number of chapters, let's say. What I really like about browsers is they're ultimately just page viewers. So as I kind of talk through some of my latest projects, formal and informal, we'll just tab through the various chapters that I've set up with you in the form of Firefox browsers or Windows, sorry. Um, that said, I can also easily drop all these links into the chat. So I will be trying to keep that open. Let me actually pull up the chat right now. And it's pretty easy for me to pause. So I will definitely talk for 45 minutes. I can truncate certain sections. Um, but if you also have questions, feel free to use the chat throughout and we can kind of intersperse this with questions or we can save it for the end. So whatever uh, feels, whatever you're most drawn to. The first link I'll share is my site. There's a page called sharing. And if you kind of pop open the hood on Firefox or Chrome or any browser, you can right click and say inspect element or developer tools. And all of my captions and links are in HTML comments. So this will give you an easy way if you visit this link to kind of check out the live links that I'm talking about, um, but also kind of bookmark those for later. I probably will not say all image credits and links, so please refer to the HTML comments for the correct attribution. I also wanted to give a shout out because the first time I saw an HTML comments as lecture format, it was by Emma Ray Brummel. Um, she was giving a digital love languages workshop called Hand Coding Round Robin at the School for Poetic Computation. So that link for Emma's is here. What I've been thinking about a lot for the Cyberfem Index is translation. So it started off as this open source, open access uh, Google spreadsheet. And Google spreadsheets are kind of problematic for a lot of reasons, the entire Google suite. Um, but for the purposes of sharing and kind of disseminating things quickly, it was a really easy way to do that. If you kind of scroll through quickly, you'll find that there's various check marks that span each row. And at the top, you'll find that the purple is yak or hack. This is the distinction between theory and practice as coined by Judy Malloy, who was an early uh, e-literature hypertext poet and like nonlinear fiction net artist. Um, all the blue is different categories. So artificial intelligence, communication technology, cyborgian theory, um, floss, free libre open source software, slime theory, et cetera. And the green are all media types. So these are your different aggregators, hacker spaces, academic articles, et cetera. But as you move through, it's easy to tell that these things are not easily siloed. They often take up multiple check marks across multiple categories. And this kind of rigidity in spreadsheets in some ways is useful, but in other ways it's quite restrictive, especially for those things that don't fit cleanly into specific categories. And they're kind of sitting in this blurry in between. I've also thrown some other links in here that might be good reference for you, but they're not, I won't be talking about them at length. Um, I'll have various links through Arena, which is kind of like a Pinterest for research. Um, it's a fun account if you want an alternative to other social medias. But here, Corey Tegler made a channel, which is a folder of blocks, which are files, called um, Radical Google Docs. So especially in the wake of everything happening last year, there's a lot of different references in here um, that are basically open source directories or indexes or syllabi, reading lists, PDF libraries. And if you 
are a compulsive downloader like I am, this will be a great starting point for you. So the second iteration of the CyberFem Index was this draft catalog. I'm gonna read through some of these pull quotes. A gender changer figures out how her computer works and she is not afraid of taking it apart. This glitch is a correction to the machine. Um, in other situations, I've done like performative readings of this, which I won't do today just for the sake of time. Um, but I do think that this draft has been a good proxy for what a performance lecturer reading might look like. So I only printed 10 copies with an espresso book machine, which is like a rapid, very like low res uh, print on demand printer. Um, it's used as like a hot glue bind. It's all black and white interiors. The margins are all messy. It's very, very low res, but I think that's kind of a fit the ethos of what I needed. And I was really just printing drafts for like a publisher proof. And this was also designed and like pushed out within three months. So it's just to emphasize, definitely a draft catalog. And we're kind of working on the final one right now with inventory press. Um, You'll kind of see that in the center, it's a bit uh, pixelated, but you have these multi-column grid with what we're calling an indexical spine down the center. And also you'll see, again, low res, but there's uh, these uh, gaps in the text with the floating number. And these are the cross-reference numbers that kind of encourage nonlinear reading throughout the publication. So within the nonlinear reading number, it would correlate with something in the indexical spine that would cause you to flip throughout the publication. So here I started with the uh, Cyber Feminist Manifesto for the 21st century. It pushes to courageous cunts from 2012. It then goes on to um, Cyberculture and the Subaltern by Radhika Gajala, Avatar Body Collision, et cetera. So you're kind of moving across this annotated chronology of sorts. And all of these excerpts also are from the voices of the people who wrote them or live transcriptions as a way to kind of integrate into this catalog as many different voices, even if I am the primary facilitator or moderator. I'm gonna click through. So the first part of the book in the draft, this might change in the final, we're basically pulling all of the different, what we're calling artifacts. So artifacts of old websites, we consider these images, these icons, these buttons, other things that would ultimately become flattened if you took a screenshot. So we're kind of trying to save the loose assets of different websites. Um, so for example, this was the logo for the Gender Changers Academy, a, ha a hacker space in Europe in the 90s. And this tool itself is actually called a mini gender changer. So they were trying to kind of co-opt this phrase, understanding that these binary gender norms are kind of built into the software and hardware that we use. The mini gender changer, if you think about an outlet, the outlet plate is called a male, whereas the plug itself is called a female. So these things are just kind of reinforced through ubiquity and daily use. Um, these are stills from Mary Magic's open source estrogen. Magic is a researcher and artist dealing with hormone hacking through online networks. The back half of the book currently contains these full uh, screen screenshots. So the Museum of Menstruation, which was all, also from the 90s, various ELIT um, hypertext fiction texts. This is uh, the 100 antitheses. There's a screenshot of this down below that we'll talk about more. Um, this was basically the manifesto for the old boys network. So rather than trying to create a clear definition as to what cyber feminism included, 
they gave a hundred sentences about what it was not. And the catalog ends with an artifact at scale called Cyberfeminism Question Mark from the Old Boys Network, which again is thinking about what does cyberfeminism include and how can we uh, embed within this definition the multiplicity of voices of all these different branches and people involved. I'll give a quick um, definition of cyberfeminism, and this will change depending on who you talk to, but to my understanding, in my belief, cyberfeminism is best explained through breaking apart the word itself. So cyber, this prefix, you first, first appeared in Norbert Wiener's cybernetics in the 1940s. And then later, this uh, was affixed to space, cyberspace, in William Gibson's Neuromancer, a 1980s sci science fiction novel. Science fiction around like the 70s, 80s, 90s was really shifting into what they called soft science fiction. Um, maybe science fiction appeared as early as like the 1910s. And at this time it was very much hard science fiction. So think about hard as in um, focusing on the tools, focusing on like the new ray gun, the spaceship, all of these like things that were a visual representation of what the future might be. Whereas soft science fiction was really thinking about the technological implications on society. It was like an STS approach, science technology society. William Gibson's Neuromancer is an important text for a lot of reasons. Um, some say that it was kind of predicting the internet before the World Wide Web existed. In many ways, it was also quite problematic. It was uh, male gazy, let's say. There are a lot of cyber babes and fembots and kind of things pointing to the male fantasy of what how women or women adjacent things appeared in this future space. So when they finally fixed cyber to feminism in 1991, Sadie Plant, the British media theorist and BNS Matrix, the Australian art collective, told they separately, it just happened to be the same year. I think there was just energy for it. Um, it was meant to be a provocation. So cyber is not a prefix that typically is associated with us, women or marginalized people. And feminism even at that time was in the US at least was coming out of second wave feminism shifting into inter intersectional feminism. So what does this mean? How can we use this as a way to provoke women or marginalized people to really reconsider what cyber fem or what the future of technology the future of, of some radical future might look like. And I think this, going back to the cybernetic origins, this feedback loop was really, really important. So you had this mix between using technology, critic, or women using technology, but also using that technology to criticize its use. So constantly you have this feedback loop of criticism and practice, criticism and practice, and provocation, et cetera. So that was the second translation, um, really thinking about how this was fixed to how it might translate from open source spreadsheet to this physical printed text, and especially in a low res way. I wanted to make a quick detour to talk about the history of spreadsheets. Um, so this first spreadsheet appeared on the Apple II on software called PhysiCalc in the 1970s. But this really took hold um, in IBM's PC in the 1980s. However, it became more popular when it was became a GUI-based version. So GUI, G-U-I, stands for Graphical User Interface. Here, this is the terminal version. Here, you're kind of starting to see like different cues to help people who don't know Terminal or Linux, how they might understand what these things mean. So things look like buttons, you can see denotations between cells and rows. Um, skewmorphism was definitely part of early GUI. So think about like on your dock, you have a trash can icon. It's indicating to us that the trash can is where you throw things away, even if it really could look like anything. I wanted to read a, so when spreadsheets first came out, they were considered functional programming for the masses, a liberatory tool for anyone who, with access to a computer can suddenly do pretty simple or somewhat complex computations. This is a quote by Ted Nelson. 
Conventional data structures, especially tables and arrays, are confined structures created from a rigid top-down specification that enforces rectangularity and regularity. So as noted through my use of the spreadsheet above, rectangularity and regularity stands for this rigid system, which Ted Nelson calls a top-down specification. So there are pre-existing categories, you kind of slot your things into them, and it doesn't really give that much space for wiggle room or the blurry lines in between, these interstices. Um, Ted Nelson is considered the father of the concept of hyperlinks, hypertext, and a lot of other early technologies. Um, this is a spread or a page from the Talmud, which is a primary religious um, the, or text of Judaism. So in the center, you have the Mishnah, which is the primary religious text. And the outer or the middle column, you have scholars commenting on the Mishnah. And in the outermost column, you have commentary on the commentary. So built into the structure of the page, you get this dialectic of different opinions and interpretations. Um, this is actually Ted Nelson holding up a spread from the Talmud, uh, citing it as one of his early inspirations for digital hypertext. So I think when we say hyperlinks, I actually like making the distinction between digital and analog because Hyperlinks have existed long before digital hyperlinks. So think about um, cross-reference numbers, annotations, bibliographies, uh, footnotes, all of these are considered early examples of hyperlinks. And you can read more about this in the N. Catherine Hale's text, Writing Machines. So here, this is a, a screenshot or an excerpt from the Whole Earth Millennium Catalog. So here we're on page 70 and we have these icons scattered throughout the book called, we're basically pushing you to different parts of the page. So here it's, if you wanna learn more about restoration forestry, you can jump 20 pages ahead. Or here in this 1999 cyberfeminism book, they actually call it a hypertextual link and they use this eye icon that would typically appear on the margins and kind of push you to different parts of the book. This is an early example of Xanadu. So Xanadu is a proto-internet. The internet we use now is called the World Wide Web. I'm sorry if some of this is really obvious. Um, I'm trying not to make assumptions about what backgrounds people have. World Wide Web is basically this, www. Um, that appeared in 89 with like the rise of personal computing and Tim Berners-Lee, but decades before that we had Xanadu. And in some ways it's quite similar to um, the web we know now. You have this long scrolling page in the center. But what's interesting about Xanadu is if you were to link to something like this purple line, it grabs a clone of the, the source material and shows you where that link existed in context. So again, built into the structure of the page, you have how we visualize citations, how we reinforce citations and actually say, this is all the different influences that helps me get to the text that you're currently looking at. So how we visualize citations was a huge inspiration for me as I began to think about what the third translation of Cyberfem might be. And this is the version of Xanadu space, which is like a three-dimensional Xanadu. Um, again, not specific to Tim Berners-Lee, but you do see like visible connections between different links um, or between different citations. It's also in this three-dimensional curve. Um, scholars at the time, like Muriel Cooper at MIT Media Lab was also thinking about the multidimensionality of digital spaces, thinking about time, uh, depth, motion, et cetera. And just a quick reference, if you're interested in the politics of citation, I encourage you to kind of dig through this channel by Sal Hanneman and a lot of other people, especially like the librarians on Arena. All right, so back to the 100 antitheses. Um, 
If the first question was how we visualize citations, the second question pushing forward the design of CyberFem was how do websites age? So this website was created in 1997, um, but still works perfectly today. Um, I could speculate it's for various reasons. They're basically using the backbones of the internet, which is HTML, CSS, JavaScript. They're also using a lot of default features. So default CSS color in the background color, defaults CSS or system fonts, Arial bold for the body of the text and default headers. So H1, H1, H2, and a list function plus default dropdowns. Um, HTML comes with a set of like pre-existing tags and things that have some default styling attached to them. So what I like about this is like, even if they try to style it a bit, for the most part, it's hard coded, it's quite simple and therefore quite durable unless something like the URL is not um, continued year after year. The site design itself and coding is pretty lightweight. It's not using a lot of like third party libraries that might degrade over time. And if any of you are in web design, we understand that a lot of new libraries are always introduced. Um, and a lot of things die out really quickly. Think of Flash, for example. So another reference for how we think about websites aging is this early net art piece by Alexei Shulgin called Form Art. So here he's also using um, default form fields, HTML form fields like buttons, text links, et cetera. But rather than changing the styling of these different buttons, he just changes the composition. Um, so instead of it being for like a bureaucratic form that you fill out for tax purposes, he's actually trying to make it into some sort of concrete poetry. Now, several decades later, this is how the site appears today. So for the most part, it's pretty similar, but now maybe the composition is a higher resolution, it's a white background, it's curved buttons. But by not styling the how the buttons appear, only where they're located, you're basically giving some space for the website to design itself as the browser updates. So this is also something I was really trying to keep in mind, not kind of force it to be exactly the same across different browsers and different ages of browsers, but really embracing this ever-changing landscape because all websites are constantly living and always in progress. So for the rest of this, I'm actually going to use a live link. Um, the Cyber Feminism Index came out with the new museum last October or November. It was commissioned by Rizo. And when they asked me to do this online exhibition, I was like, yeah, that would be exciting. What do you need from me? And they quoted the net artist, Olia Lialina, who said, all you need is a link. So I didn't have to actually do anything specific for this launch. They call it an online exhibition, but it's really just the index that we had been building. Um, so this was created by myself, my collaborator, Angeline Meitzler, with front end support from Janine Rosen and PDF support from Charles Braskowski, who is actually one of the co-founders of Arena. When you first arrive, you get this green loading symbol, which also appears as your sorting by titles and et cetera. And the site kind of comes alive as you um, start moving through it. I'm also realizing that this, that's a bug, <laughs> prevents this uh, glow effect from happening. So similar to trying to think about like these interstitial spaces, I wanted the site to appear pretty default unless someone is interacting with it. So it kind of feels like a standard table. And as you move, the site comes alive. So you have these various flowing elements. As you click different things, it's added to the side panel, which we call the trail. And of course, you can X out of certain things to kind of develop your own reader. But even if it was being clicked quite intuitively, it's promoting this idea of learning trails or associative learn. Um, there might be some reason that you're kind of attracted to opening certain things and creating your own kind of reader or download, or you can do it very intentionally and use it for a class or et cetera. You also have the ability to download these texts. 
this might take a while. It kind of chugs when I have a lot of tabs open. And there's some indents and other graphic problems. Um, but you can basically grab like everything that you opened and download it. Paul Suelis for Rhizome wrote about the download as an act of resistance, especially in a time when we don't own a lot of the content that we're putting online. So Instagram, you throw something online and it's owned by Instagram. They can use it for ads and not compensate you, for example. And you can also view all the different downloads that appeared here. Actually, I haven't seen this in a while. So it looks like some were happening in the past few days, which is nice. I also wanted to quickly just go through different examples of CyberFem. So this is a screen artifact from um, Prema Murthy called Bindi Girl, which was really thinking about the fetishization of Asian women online, specifically South Asian women, and specifically with this increasing rise in porn culture. Um, an artifact from Brutal Miss, which was Cloud Kinky's History of Gynecology, Cyber Powwow by Skawanetti, um, one of the first indigenous online networks based in Canada. The African De Declaration of Internet Rights and Freedoms. And this um, tool that we saw before, the Gender Changers for a Gender Changers Academy. Mujeres in Red, which was a logo for a Latin hack feminist group. Um, depending on what region you're in and depending on what decade you're in, the name Cyberfem changes quite a bit. So this includes hack feminism, um, net femmies in Korea, um, black cyber feminism coined by uh, Kashana Gray, glitch feminism, legacy Russell, etc. The women's web ring, which was an icon that you could put on your website and any other website part of that network, if you clicked, it would randomly send you to that site. So trying to build in this sense of um, locality in a very ephemeral space. And this icon, which I thought was so beautiful, um, I and originally saw it on this site by Gash Girl called Dark Core. So this was the old website. I'm using the web Wayback Machine because a lot of these sites are now dead. But this artifact I just thought was so striking, um, very low res, which I also kind of like. And I was telling my friends about this and my friend and colleague, someone I work with quite often, um, sent me this on Christmas day as in an email. It was very, I could kind of make sense of the, uh, the form, but it was unclear to me. So she actually sent me, it took a few weeks to print, but this 3D printed version of the, the form, which I thought was quite nice. It was supposed to be a bracelet, but we have to do some other proofing. But I do think it's interesting to think about these different translations of what these digital artifacts, how they might appear in real space, especially since these were never really intended to kind of live outside of an ephemeral space. This was the longest chapter. The other ones will be really quick. So let me move through this. So Laura and I are part of a group called CSS. One, because we all teach interactive things, HTML and CSS are the backbones of the internet, as mentioned, um, but also it's our last names, Combs, Schwulst, Sue. So Laura Combs, Laurel Schwulst and I started this on January 1st, 2020, which we claimed was the year of perfect vision and we were wrong. Maybe it was right. Maybe it helped reveal a lot of the things that are very important for all of us. Um, but I don't think anyone could have really predicted what happened. When we first bought or created this thing, we used this tiny character as our favicon, like this. The favicon is the icon on the tab, fave icon, favorite icon. And when we uh, saw it, we liked it because it looked like three separate islands that were clearly unified in a line, but we didn't actually know what it meant. Later, we went on to adopt this in March 1st of 2020, 2020, yes, um, 
you can actually buy Unicode characters as a way to support the Unicode Foundation. Um, it's kind of like buying a star or buying a tree. It still definitely can be used by everyone, but you, let's see if I can find my name. Yeah, so this is our mark. We're on the bronze sponsors, which is quite affordable. The gold sponsors are very expensive. Like Vint Surf is here. Vint Surf created IP, um, internet protocol. I wonder if there's some other, like IBM bought their cloud. Red Lobster bought the lobster emoji. But as we began to do research about what this dot actually meant, we learned that it was downright diagonal ellipses. And it's typically used in mathematical matrices to indicate and so forth. So in many ways to indicate more, to indicate a void. And for us, this was a good way of thinking about unstable signs. So one of our mentors is Sheila Levrant de Bretville, who um, runs the Yale Department of, or Yale School of Art, the graphic design department, she also started, was part of the consciousness raising movement and started the feminist art program with many other important people at uh, CalArts. Sorry, let me pull this up. But Sheila described unstable signs as kind of co-opting the use of these ubiquitous symbols like a typographic glyph and destabilizing it to kind of indicate or inject some other uh, context into these other texts. So for her, that was the ellipses. The ellipses was a way to indicate inclusivity. Even if people weren't named, it was meant to, so you can kind of insert yourself. So I think almost subconsciously, when we were drawn to that diagonal ellipses, we were thinking about this kind of symbolism or like provocation. Um, so Laura and I also held a workshop together at uh, Southland Institute, which is an alternative education program in Los Angeles run by Joe Potts and Adam Feldsmith. And for this, we were thinking about the asterisk, which we also thought perhaps this could also be an unstable sign. Asterisks are something that we all use quite often. Um, but here we are thinking about maybe the asterisk can be used as a publishing tool in order to foreground secondary authors and kind of, again, inject your own voice into all of these primary texts. So for our first um, exercise, we had about 35 participants. Using the Zoom annotation tool, we all drew one line and our name. And by the end, we got this very cacophonous, vibrant asterisk in which one line represents one person. Oh, I can also drop this into the chat. Um, I wanted to give a quick overview of that lecture just to give some background on the asterisk. We actually used Arena as our lecture tool, just using the slideshow function. I'll go through this this lecture was supposed to be 40 minutes, but I'll try to truncate it into five. So I'll click through and I'm not going to talk about all of the different things. So this was an asterisk that was growing that Laura and I created. We realized that the arena logo itself was using two Unicode asterisks used called the six pointed asterisk. It was used as a lot of different page breaks and chapter breaks across time. I'll also drop this link in the chat after if you want to dig through um, this at length. Maybe it would be easier if I clicked into it like this. So one of the first, uh, typically asterisks were used pretty early on to denote certain changes that the secondary author added to the text. This was later used as a marker for an action or a direction, 
called Paralanguage, um, first seen in the, um, what is this comic called? Charlie Brown comics, sorry. Um, so, Char so Charlie Brown here saying sigh, which is, ah, but it's denoted using two asterisks surrounding the word. Asterisks always also determine um, what's required. So in surveys, you often see the asterisk as a way to enforce something before it can be submitted. And you also see the rise in asterisks now as we begin to use more chatting tools that don't allow for bold or italics. So for example, iMessage, Instagram comments, et cetera. This is the cover of a new program for graphic design by David Reinfurt. Um, he uses new asterisks around the new as a form of emphasis. This is also a form of markdown. So for example, uh, Arena actually accepts Markdown in its uh, blocks. So if I click this, you'll see that single asterisks means italics, double is bold, triple is bold italics. So by it renders like this. So it's also a form of markup. And this reference I love, this was an inspiration for that opening Zoom exercise as well. It was for um, a workshop led by Muriel Cooper and Otto Pien, where same thing, each person had a line to represent um, their, their participation in this workshop and fellowship, which was also then used uh, for the Shannon Ebner book, which was designed also by David Reinfurt. I also particularly like how back way back when, um, without password managers, if you forgot, there was this tool called the asterisk password spy, which would let you kind of see what these coded um, words were if you forgot your, your password. Okay, so this one, I'll just click through. So when Trump was still on Twitter, people would actually use asterisks in order to obstruct it for the algorithm while indicating to the reader, we know that this says Trump, but the algorithm would kind of bypass it. So it was a kind of a way of doing an open critique. If I were to use various closed captioning tools, if I were to say, fuck you, it would automatically censor those things. Tarina Bell and The Guardian said that the asterisk is perhaps the only keystroke we have that's capable of stripping words of some power. So this is Emma Solkowitz, an artist most well known for the mattress performance at Columbia. Um, so Chuck Close was basically going to have a retrospective, I believe at the MoMA, and then all of these allegations about sexual assault came out and harassment. So the curators decided to leave up the show, but to have some sort of asterisk or annotation at the bottom that indicated his wrongdoing. And Emma Solkowitz protested the show by putting asterisks all over her body in order to indicate that for what Chuck Close was just an asterisk of his career were actually a lot of different people who were actually impacted uh, gravely by Close's actions. Let's let this load. So Meg Miller, who's also a friend of ours, um, she also has been doing study on the gender star, which is in many languages, you have like a masculine root and, or I guess a neutral root, quote unquote, and then a masculine or feminine suffix. So in this case, and she's currently in Berlin, she was doing studies on how they're trying to include the gender star in order to create a gender neutral word rather than having it uh, read as male or female. And this was actually accepted by um, government paperwork in Hamburg. They started including the gender star as of a few years ago. So that's, some people criticize it because it's still, 
almost like an erasure of this mark. And I think that people are trying to include, would rather like to overhaul in it language so you don't actually have to erase the suffix to begin with. Um, but I think it is a step in some direction. Yeah, so this is, there's some various texts in here about that. Let me scroll ahead. Okay, so for the workshop itself, the first prompt was about primitive hypertext. So Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney, both science fiction authors, um, we had an interview at MIT in the mid 90s and they came up with this excerpt, which I will read from here. I generally have four or five books open around the house. They don't relate to each other and the ideas they present bounce off of one another. And I like this effect. So I guess in that way, I'm kind of using a primitive hypertext. So we also asked students to create an asterisk and tell us what its use might be, whether it was erasure, whether it was troublemaking, whether it was an omission, something like this. So Kyle said, my asterisk activates actions in text, hugging, touching, feeling. Donald Zhu said, my asterisk references a sudden thought or connection, a new branch. Uh, Kate said, this asterisk pops up to clarify information, I data and ideas using a second person voice inspired by Microsoft's Clippy. And Paloma said, my asterisk is for collecting information communally. So by the end, we basically came up with this large document with a bunch of asterisks in between. Everyone selected two to three texts or excerpts from texts around their house. And their first annotation was giving a citation for that text. So this Octavia Butler quotes, when you opened up Laura's um, annotations, you could basically see what she had cited. I realize we're a little short on time, so I'm going to click through this so you can get a sense of all of the secondary annotations. Because the text is rather long, I think it's quite nice how much this populates over time. Uh, this was a hacked version of Hypothesis JS by our friend Richard Caceres. And you can turn off the base layer as well. So when we turn off this, we're, base, we're only left with the annotations themselves. And as you slowly turn off everyone's name, you're left with kind of like our starry night, which we call our bag of stars. Um, an Ursula Le Guin quote I'll be talking about in a minute or so. It is 1045. I had two other pieces I wanted to show, but is it oh, worth no, no, pausing? Pardon me, you're, com you're completely fine. Yeah, you're completely okay. fine. Whatever, right. whatever you'd like to do. Don't, don't okay. feel rushed. Perfect. Um, these questions, these parts are quite short. I just wanted to introduce some tools. Um, so Print Arena was a tool that I made with Ekina Ijeoma and Charles Braskowski for MIT. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, so if you go to Print Arena, then you can basically plug in any channel. Uh, Cab and I made it, and with David Reinfurt, made a channel called Hard Copy. So if you plug this in, it basically exports a book that you can print with Lulu. Um, 
Uh, Lulu was another print-on-demand software, kind of like Blurb or Artifact Uprising or the Espresso Book Machine. And what we, what I liked about this channel especially was this distinction between soft copy and hard copy, which is something I've also really been thinking about. Think about the different translations of Cyberfem, for example. This proposal is about soft copy. This is by David Reinford, an essay he wrote in the 90s. Um, Soft copy was a neolo neologism, but best understood in opposition to its opposite, the hard copy. So the soft copy is a uh, fluid, mutable, constantly changing, and the hard copy, typically associated with print, is fixed, permanent, registered, et cetera. So the book launch was actually held at ORG, which is uh, a soft, uh, sorry, what do they call it? A software shop in Lower East Side, Manhattan. So uh, this is kind of how it appears once it's printed. They're quite small, like a pocketbook size. And this was kind of the, it was a co-launch between the Arena Annual and um, Print Arena itself, as well as some different postcard wares that um, David often makes with ORG. We also serve slushies. This is the bodega around the corner called the Snowman Deli, and they make this huge snowman. So we got different slushies from them and had some shenanigans. And this is the arena annual itself. So a few years ago, I wrote, I wrote a text called On the Poetry of Tools, um, which they republished in the annual early last year. So again, connected to this bag of stars, I wanted to read an excerpt by Ursula Le Guin. This was also in the um, asterisk channel. Before the tool that forces energy outward, we made the tool that brings energy home. Prior to the preeminence of sticks, swords, and the hero's killing tools, our ancestors' greatest invention was the container. The recipient, the holder of the story, the bag of stars. What I love about this text is not only is she reimagining the first tool as the basket and not the spear, this also reimagines the first protagonist as the gatherer and not the hunter. Um, Ignota Books actually reprinted this with a new foreword by Donna Haraway, super cheap. I recommend you purchasing it. It's very, very small. Um, but this was one of the things we were thinking about for this latest online exhibition I created with AIR Gallery, which is one of the oldest women-only galleries and co-ops in Brooklyn. They're currently in Dumbo. So this was designed by workshops, which was formerly um, Project Projects. Each week or each month, two pieces were rolled out, either a commissioned work that was online-based or an interview. And for one of these interviews, we had the honor of introducing or interviewing Adrienne Marie Brown. Adrienne Marie Brown is an activist and healer and um, organizer based in Detroit. And in this interview, which I can also drop in here, she talks about the web webbing. Let me pull that up. I like to think of relationships like a spider web, something that can look very diaphanous and tender, but that's actually quite strong because of the material. I love this idea of webbing. And for us, especially at, with CSS, we're thinking about not only webbing, but how this might connect to citational networks. So Bruno Latour calls a network, a set of associations that leads to more associations. So if you're only taking the things that are given to you, it will only lead to the things along that pathway. But if you actively try to find other speakers, readers, artists outside of those networks, it will naturally blossom into those other worlds. And I think it's important to foreground that and like create some sense of belonging for yourself in these spaces, especially through citations. Not only as an academic citation, but as a citation for everyday life. Um, to understand that we are 
single authorship doesn't exist. We don't come to these ideas on our own and they, we should give credit actively to all the people that helped us multi-author multi these texts. So I'm actually writing about On Gathering for the Knight Foundation. They're creating an inaugural publication called Shift Space. I think this is coming out this month, maybe even this week. Um, but I'm excited to be featured alongside these amazing writers because I am not a writer. I find it extremely agonizing. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity, but it really does think about what gathering means in an online space, especially in the forms of storytelling and memory work. And this is also the topic of uh, the MFA course I'm teaching at Yale this semester, which is called On Gathering. Also drop this in there. So On Gathering has only two projects, plus a lot of various guests that you can see in red. Um, it's really thinking about digital collections and virtual events. So how might we think about gathering in its um, material and social forms, especially in online spaces? That said, we don't really know what projects are coming out of this yes, we just started the second one, um, but it's been really nice to see like how people think about collecting or rather this tender act of gathering for your community. It gives you, a, it gave me like a really deep sense of where these people feel like they belong in their various communities. Let me quickly drop this in here before I forget, but that's all I have for you. I realize much longer than I expected, <laughs> sorry about, the, the length of the presentation. Let me actually stop screen sharing. No, you're absolutely fine. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, I was hoping that there, we'd have an opportunity to ask a few questions to- Sure, please. I'd like the, to turn the floor over to the students. Don't be shy. Um, I have one if no one else does. Um, hey, Mindy, could you talk a little bit about how all of these different ideas that you're kind of exploring and building through your projects um, and workshops feed back into your larger approach to teaching design and kind of how that plays out in pedagogy for you? Yeah, definitely. I think that, well, I think right now I have the luxury of being able to teach a class that is very specific to my own personal interests. And I feel like sometimes you don't really get that opportunity. I've always been interested in like interactive media and I typically teach intro to code. Um, but I think so sometimes with technical classes, you're focusing more on like outcome or like making an avant-garde website, an experimental website. But I think this, Yale class, for example, really starts to feel like an R&D class for myself. Um, so not only are students thinking about online collections, lecture performances, alternative uses of online events or examples of, those are all very important references that I can also learn from. Um, so I think that the goal is for pedagogy to really feel like a mirror of your own work and for you to learn as much from the people in the group as they do from you. Um, you're kind of like a moderator or a facilitator, but less like a top-down instructional approach. Um, and I think it varies. Like some of the other foundations classes I'm teaching, it definitely does feel more hierarchical, especially when the classes are more technical. Um, but yeah, I do think that moving forward, my goal would be to veer solely into this more seminar studio-based approach where it does feel like it's a more generative space for myself and for the students. Also, thank you for the poster. I appreciated that, Ed. I have a question. I'm not exactly sure how to word it. It's basically on escapism though. So I feel like your work is about the internet and um, we're, on, we're online a lot. It's very critical. Um, and I think that it's really easy to kind of 
critique everything or to engage in everything in this like hypercritical, hyper academic way, especially given your area of research again. So I just have a question on like, yeah, just like escapism. Like, what do you, do you have um, spaces where you can just escape and kind of try to step back from that criticism? Are there kind of like certain aspects of media, like certain genres of film where you're just like, I'm going to enjoy this. Um, do you have practices around, around that kind of, yeah, just that stepping back from critical engagement? This is, I'm sure maybe a question worth opening up to the group. It's something that I feel like I've had an identity crisis over these past this past year in quarantine. Um, even if a lot of my work is online, I'm used to traveling around a lot and talking with people. But this year, I found that all of my work is screen based, and perhaps all of my leisure time is screen based. So it's for me very destabilizing and like uncomfortable. So now I found that. I tried to step back away from screen-based things a lot. And it's, in terms of my work, trying to think about things that are less online, things that are more physical. Um, but in terms of my leisure, really trying to create some sense of embodiment for myself that is removed from all of this. So I actually think I participated less in like Zoom events and like alternative online events. It was just like too close to home for me. Um, yeah, so if anything right now, it's been, I'm, I'm in upstate New York. So a lot of hiking, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation, uh, a lot of like gardening and things. But that said, I don't know how this will translate once I'm back in the city and we're like back in this grind again. So I guess I'm curious to hear from you. Like, have you done certain things to escape from our day to day? Um, I think it's a my parents got a puppy and they live like an hour and 15 minutes away from from school so I go visit them and their pup and play with their puppy a lot um and lots of like walks and things like that so I'm actually really fortunate that I was living on the east coast and chose to came, come back to Cranbrook um for school because I have a lot of family here um my parents also have like a house in the woods that I go to sometimes so very similar things in that way but um, I also have like a writing practice. I've written a column for the past three years. So that's also kind of where I'm coming yeah. from. I just really love superhero movies. Like I am, I understand all of the issues. I'm fully here for Godzilla versus King Kong. Um, and I also play a lot of gardenscapes. I just yeah, will, yeah. like sit. So I think, I think that very similar to you, I think that, um, but there are some things that I do on the screen, but yeah, I just, I like asking that question to people who critically engage with culture a lot, because I think it's a really difficult kind of, it's really difficult sometimes to make practices around that, but really necessary. Yeah, yeah. I think it also helps when like you have community around that doesn't necessarily only focus on that thing. So I feel like I'm like a weird galaxy of connections where I have friends in a lot of different groups. Like my partner is a ceramicist. He barely even knows how to use email. So I think that helps because then I can't talk about this at home. And if, even if I do, it's not going to be at a certain depth that I could talk about it with other peers. So I think that helps or also it would just be a lot of the same thing. And thinking about this all the time feels like in many ways kind of depressing because a lot of things need to change. Um, so I do think that to re-energize is important, yeah. Last week we had, uh, we had a kind of informal spring break at the academy and I spent, I think it was three days um, up north, which is kind of like Saugerties, it's in the woods. But anyway, the, there, there was a very strong visual image that, that I had where my, my children, I have, a, I have a 17 or 18 year old that's a senior in high school. I have a, a 16 year old and a 13 year old and they, they're on they're as everyone is they're doing online schooling and so you know we woke up in the morning and i looked at my three kids my three children who who had not changed their clothes were laying in bed had the laptops open and honestly i i, could, I, I thought about the I, two things really really powerfully hit me was were the scenes from wally -E of the spaceship where people people yeah were transported around uh, laying down. Um, and then the other thing is just the, you know, the, the 
your iPhone or Android phone will automatically log your steps. And I thought, I thought, yeah. you know, the the I think that the human being needs to be a holistic uh, animal. That that development is Absolutely. physical, intellectual, and spiritual, and those three come up together, or or they or they they wither together. And looking at that image, I, I mean, I was horrified. I thought, what? I know a lot of it is the result of the pandemic, but it's a confluence of both the pandemic as well as information technology. You know, I, I looked and I thought, oh my God, what kind of a generation are we raising? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, Joyce Carol Oates, the author, says that all, all of her ideas have come when she's climbed to the top of a huge hill by her house. That's where she's able to come up with the first sentence, the last sentence, and perhaps the climax of all of her novels. So this, I think, is quite nice. Like, what is your version of that hill? And most likely, it will be outside. I don't think it will be sitting in front of your computer trying to find your, like, brilliant idea. Um, but that said, I mean, even putting on real pants, I don't know. Maybe if you guys are going to studio, it's different. But yeah, we've all really been reevaluating a lot this year. You don't need real pants in studio. <laughs> OK. Yeah, exactly. It's sweat like on and off line. Other questions? We have a few more moments. I have sort of uh, tied to what Ed was asking about of um, both in teaching, but also in how like workshops and collaborations come about for you and how um, like how you make room for those and how they contribute. Yeah, I've kind of found that every single project I've ever worked on has been collaborative. I don't know why that happens. I think I definitely prefer collaborative work or else I like spin out. Um, I think it's nice having like a sounding board. I also think that a lot of my works in many ways are surrounding communities, even if they're online. And I think having a collective dialogue is really important. Um, but that said, how do, the, how do I find collaborators? Um, Less so this year, but a lot of cold emailing. Like I started working with AIR Gallery because a mutual friend introduced us because we were thinking about similar topics. But even now, um, we've spent one year, almost, yeah, we started last April organizing the online exhibition, Scalability Project. And I still have never met Patty or Rox in person. So it is funny how these, how these, these things emerge. Um, yeah, I guess I'm curious to hear from you. I think it definitely helps finding people in school. Like a lot of the people I work with now, I definitely worked with through undergrad and grad school. Like, do you find that a lot of your collaborations occur because of physicality or how else do you find your collaborators? Yeah, I think that's something that uh, I, in speaking with students that has come up a lot this year of, um, you know, how to collaborate and how to, interact, especially when we're not allowed to physically really be in the same spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but traditionally, Cranbrook is really collaborative and it's really encouraged to kind of like cross departments and go into these spaces. So yeah, if students have any comments about, you know, how that's been for you this year, of how you've had to kind of orchestrate that or if it's worked. I can speak if I don't want to speak too much. So if someone else wants to go, you can jump in. I think it's proximity for me. So that doesn't always mean like physical proximity. That could be that like we're on similar digital platforms a lot. So I don't know if you are on Clubhouse. I am on Clubhouse and <laughs> it's an interesting thing. It's very interesting. Um, and so like you can go in clubhouse rooms with the same people over and over again. And so it's like that kind of proximity that I think and kind of ongoing conversation that can bring new relationships and new collaborators, even though with clubhouse, it's very common to not even ask people where they're from. So you're just kind of like in this random clubhouse with someone that you only see one tiny picture of them and um, engage that way. So for me, it's a lot of proximity. I'm also fortunate that I'm a tech in one of the shops mm -hmm. on campus. So I also just 
get to see a lot of people when they're making their work and helping with that. So yeah, that's what it is for me. Yeah, I think that what you're saying reminds me of this notion of weak ties. I think that these days it's been really easy for us to see people to some degree that we know really well. You make time for the people you know well, on site or offline, um, or those are the same thing, on and offline. But it's really hard to like see your acquaintances. I haven't talked to an acquaintance in a year. <laughs> especially being upstate. I don't like run into friends or friends of friends on the street. So I wonder like if Clubhouse or these other more casual third places are ways for you to bump into these people again. Um, a third place is Ray Oldenburg's idea of the space between home and work, which right now is all in the same house. But like your local dive, your library, your park, like where are these places where people gather casually where you can bump into people? And that's what I've had a hard time finding. Um, yeah, physicality helps, but I am convinced there's a version of this online. Yeah. We have time for a last question. Can I talk about collaboration? Please. Absolutely. Yeah. I recently tried to collaborate with different people, both like online and also like physical, we meet in person. I feel like is this is a great opportunity for me to collaborate with people. I feel there are more inspirations coming up when I collaborate with people because when like I'm making the work for myself, just for an individual human being. Sometimes, like I just sit in my studio for a day and try to find different, a lot of resources, but it's still like uh, is harder for me to get new, new fresh ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I found collaborate with different people uh it's easier for me for us to build a work and i also think uh i find like my collaborators have some similar personalities as me or maybe we doing some similar things but they also kind of from different background and and the collaboration between these I, I found really enjoy. Yeah, I think like interdisciplinary collaboration is so powerful because one, I feel like translation also comes into play. You have to figure out how to explain the value of your thing to someone else and vice versa. Um, and I also, yeah, it kind of like takes you out of your bubble for a moment. But yeah, I think that working with people from different disciplines, trying to introduce new things into your world, it will naturally create other connections with things you're already thinking about. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. One last um, one if somebody has, if nobody else has a question, kind of related to that. Um, could you talk, Mindy, a little bit about how you structure kind of the, the working on projects and the cross-pollination with CSS? Because um, I saw on your website that uh, on this first day of 2021, you, you've had some realizations regarding work and kind of the independent domains list in that little table. Could you talk about figuring that out, sorting it, and how that works in a more practical sense for the studio? For sure. Yeah, I think that because the three of us are all designers and teachers, that people assume that when we put our names on the website together, we were a graphic design studio even if we explicitly stated we're not a graphic design studio. But I think that that makes sense, that kind of assumption. Um, last year, we were really trying to weigh different projects and determine like how we like working together. Because for us, we're thinking about like a long-term collaborative thing. We didn't want to do a lot of projects the first year and then kind of burn out. Um, the first year we did a lot of internal projects, or sorry, external projects that we kept internal. 
So from certain big scales like Ikea to more institutional scales like UCLA, uh, et cetera. But I think, again, we were all feeling pretty dissatisfied from those because we already do studio contract work, freelance work on our own. Um, so we wanted to figure out like, we would only take a project if it was something the three of us couldn't do without the others. So right now we're thinking about what we're calling a gift for every year. Um, so right now we're writing a paper about multidimensional citation, which is being edited by Meg Miller. So this is something that we've all been thinking about and we feel like it will not only benefit ourselves and our students, but also try to think about citations as a practice for everyday life outside of academic citations. Um, just thinking about attribution more holistically. So we're hoping to release that probably middle of the year. Um, we also uh, internally try to test out a lot of different tools. So we've used Basecamp and Discord and et cetera, but this has almost become like a prototyping thing more than like a project development thing, only because again, we were already doing so much of that. Like I left a studio environment intentionally so I could focus on my own interests. And generally I've never been much of a formalist. Um, for better or worse, right? So I think that we're just trying to make sure that CSS is beneficial to all of our practices and a good supplement for all of them. But yeah, I agree, it's kind of cryptic, right? <laughs> well, I'm glad it's like piquing your interest because we're also like figuring it out as we go. Okay, well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, that was it. great. Thank you so much for the questions and for listening to me talk about what I'm thinking about. And I'm looking forward to meeting a few of you tomorrow. So if we can talk more about your work then. It's fantastic. Okay. Thanks everyone. everyone.